This is the web transmission service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. It's a tradition of the Institute that every year around Halloween, RCMI member and award-winning science fiction author Derwin Mack speaks on the lore of the season. This year's topic, the strange story of the writing of Frankenstein, built, not born. Derwin is also a science fiction writer and anthology writer. He has won two Aurora Awards, Canada's National Award for Science Fiction Writing and the Alberta Book Publishing Award. And in addition, he also has the dubious honor of being the first and only person to capture a Pokemon inside the RCMI. <laughs> Derwin likes horror movies and researching the historical base. This led him to Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, the subject of this evening's presentation. And that being said, a warm welcome, Derwin, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Pat. So, Frankenstein, that's the name you always hear around this time of year. The channels, TV channels always show Frankenstein movies. There's lots of them out there, I've lost count. And inevitably, sometime tomorrow, somebody somewhere is going to dress up as the monster from Frankenstein. So let's look at the history of this, this story, right? And Frankenstein was written by this person, Mary Shelley, uh, that's her married name. And she was born Mary Godwin. Uh, the author of Frankenstein. Now, she was only uh, 19 years old when she wrote Frankenstein. And she said, people have often asked me how a girl of such tender years came to write Frankenstein. Right? And in order to understand how she wrote Frankenstein and the background behind it, you have to look at her family. Right? So we'll start with her mother, Mary Wollstonecraft. Right? And Mary Wollstonecraft was an early feminist an early left-wing uh, liberal thinker, and she was famous for writing a book called A Vindication of the Rights of Women, right? which was advocated for uh, giving women the same educational opportunities that men had. This was considered very, very radical in the 18th century. Right? Now, uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, along with many other liberal and left-wing thinkers, uh, went to France during the revolution. Uh, France had, was over, had overthrown its monarchy and the revolution was going on and, it, and Paris attracted intellectuals from all across Europe. And there Mary Wollstonecraft joined a group of English speaking, that is British and American intellectuals who were watching the revolution. And in Paris she met an American named Gilbert Imlay. Now, Gilbert Imlay had been a soldier in the Continental Army, fighting for American independence and against the king. So, of course, he was suddenly a very popular with the British intellectuals over in Paris, right? Um, he was a businessman, but with a somewhat disreputable past. Uh, he was involved in land speculation in, in Kentucky and was reputed to have cheated Daniel Boone in a real estate fraud. And he, he left the United States with lots of unpaid debts, right? And then when he got to Paris, he made his money uh, using American ships to bring in goods that the French couldn't get because the British ships were no longer going to France. And, but he was, you know, the, the, the left-wing intellectuals loved him because uh, he talked about you know, freedom and liberty and egalitarianism, and he even talked about the abolition of slavery, although recent research in the last few years has discovered that he was somewhat of a hypocrite because one of his, one of his ships was used to carry slaves to America, right? Yeah. Uh, now, he also managed to get himself a job in the U.S. Embassy in Paris, uh, despite having the side business and his rather disreputable business interests in the United States and his unpaid debts. So obviously back then the conflict of interest rules for government employees was a, were a lot more lenient than they are now. Now, 
Gilbert Imlay uh, also had a somewhat uh, disreputable reputation regarding women. He liked lots of them, and he loved them and left them. But that didn't stop Mary Wollstonecraft from forming a relationship with him, and they both subscribed to uh, liber lib liberal ideas of free love and having a relationship outside marriage. So they had a relationship, and Gilbert registered Mary as his wife, Mrs. Inlay, at the U.S. Embassy in Paris, even though they weren't married. Now, there is a reason for that. That's because the French Revolution was getting dangerous. Now, there is a legend or a myth that the French Revolution created this great egalitarian liberal democratic republic based on egalité, liberté, and fraternité. Um, in actuality, what was going on there was that the French revolutionaries had divided into different factions, all of which were trying to kill each other. And although Paris was attracting liberal and left-wing philosophers and thinkers from across Europe. It actually turned out to be the worst place to be a liberal thinker or philosopher or intellectual because the French were killing people who weren't as radical as the person next to them, right? Uh, Mary um, sided with the Jacobin Club, which gave her additional protection. Now, the Jacobins turned out to be the most violent and extreme of the different groups in revolutionary France, and she got to watch her new friends execute her old friends underneath the guillotine, right? So this was the, and then to make things even worse for, uh, for Mary and the other British expatriates there, uh, shortly after she got to Paris, France declared war in Great Britain. And even though they were left-wing uh, intellectuals and rebelling against their own government, the fact that they were foreigners from a, from a from a country, from an enemy country, made them suspect. Hence, that's why Gilbert registered her as the wife of an American. Now, they had a relationship, and they had a daughter named Fanny Inlay, born in 1794. Shortly after Fanny was born, Gilbert fled to England, not to escape from the violence of the French Revolution, but rather to escape from Mary and Fanny. Um, as much as he believed in free love, uh, he also wanted freedom from family responsibility, <laughs> right? Well, Mary then followed Gilbert to England and discovered that Gilbert was, had, was now living with an actress and wanted nothing to do with Mary or Fanny. So uh, Mary attempted suicide twice. Uh, once, the first attempt, she took poison and was revived by Gilbert. Uh, no one knows how he did it. And in the second attempt, she threw herself into the Thames River to drown herself, but some passers-by saw her and fished her out of the river. Right. Uh, so, still alive, she decided that uh, she was going to get on with her life and not try to get Gilbert Imlay anymore. And she gave up dating bad boys right, and met William Godwin, who will become the father of the author of Frankenstein. Now, William Godwin was another left-wing thinker. Uh, he had the reputation of being the English Voltaire, a writer, philosopher, author, novelist. And he was another supporter of the French Revolution, but did not go to France. And he had written a, a best-selling novel called The Adventures of Caleb Williams. Uh, now, unlike Gilbert Finlay, uh, William Godwin did not have a string of girlfriends that he had loved and dumped and impregnated, right? And he was a kind-hearted soul, and he and Mary got along, and so they did form a relationship. And even though both of them did not really believe that marriage was an essential institution in society, they got married anyway. And marriage suited Mary quite well, as she said to one of her friends, a husband is like a useful piece of furniture in the household, so long as he is not a clumsy fixture. Right? So uh, they got married on March 29, 1797. And on August 30, 1797, Mary gave birth to a daughter, also named Mary. Right? So the daughter is, was known as Mary Godwin, but we know her better today as Mary Shelley. Right? I know it's confusing with the number of people named Mary, right? And later on, we'll see a lot of people named Fanny. Um, but uh, it was a very difficult 
childbirth. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft failed to um, discharge the placenta. Uh, she got infected and she died three weeks later, unfortunately, on September 10, 1797. And she was buried at St. Pancras Church. Uh, young Mary never knew her mother, and she always regretted not growing up with a mother figure. Right? So she would often, as she was growing up through her childhood and teen years, go to visit the grave, and she would also bring books there and read books by the grave, and if she had to write letters or poems or other compositions, she would bring her pen and paper and write them at the grave too. Uh, visiting the grave often was her way of forming a relationship with a mother whom she had never known or met. Right? And as we shall see later, she went on dates with boyfriends at the grave too. Right? So, so that's, uh, that's the, those are the parents of, of Mary Shelley or Mary Godwin Shelley. Now, William Godwin um, did remarry. Four years later, he married Mary Jane Claremont, who was literally the girl next door. Right? She lived in the house beside his. Right? Now, Mary Jane Claremont uh, was originally from Switzerland, and she already had two illegitimate children by a Swiss merchant named Charles Gallus, uh, Claire Claremont and Charles Claremont. Claire is going to become important in the story. There's, there's a picture of Claire. So, these are the children now in the Godwin household. Uh, they had no, only two of them had the same pair of parents. So let's go through the children. There's Fanny Imlay, the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft and Gilbert Imlay. Then there's, there was Claire Claremont and Charles Claremont, uh, the children of Mary Jane Claremont and Charles Gallus. Those are the only two children who had, who had the same parents. Right? Uh, then there was Mary Godwin, the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft and William Godwin. And then uh, William Godwin and Mary Jane had their own child, William Godwin Jr. Right? So this is a very complicated mix of children with different coming from various different parents, either present, absent, or dead. Alas, William Godwin fell on financial difficulties. His books were no longer selling. And he didn't have much income. And Mary Jane insisted that they earn some income to support the family, of course. So she got him into publishing children's books. Now, since Mary Jane knew German, uh, she could translate Swiss and German children's books into English. And one of the earliest English versions of the Swiss family, Robinson, was translated by Mary Jane and published by William Godwin. And he had a house. And the bottom floor of the house, the ground floor of the house, had a window, and he put his books in the window so passers-by could see them, and they could go inside the house and browse through the books and purchase them. And the family lived on the floors above the ground floor. Right? Now, it was a rather badly kept house in a slum area, but at least it was a house. Right? Then William Godwin began receiving fan letters from a poet named Percy Bysshe Shelley. Some of you may have heard of him. Now, he was a famous poet and radical philosopher. He had been expelled from Oxford for promoting atheism. And he had traveled to Ireland, uh, published pamphlets for Irish independence, and attended Irish nationalist rallies. Uh, certainly not anything any respectable Englishman would be doing at the time. And he had gotten a lot of attention from the British Parliament, none of it positive attention, for his activities. Uh, now, his father was a Whig member of Parliament who, of course, disowned him for engaging in such disreputable activities. Now, Percy Shelley wrote the most amusing fan letters to William Godwin. Uh, in one of them, he mentioned that he thought Godwin had already died and, and wrote, I had enrolled your name in the list of the honorable dead, and commented he was surprised to find that Godwin was still alive, but was pleasantly pleased. Uh, Shelley also bragged about money. He bragged that, in his letters, he bragged that he was son of a man of fortune in Sussex, which is technically true. And he also bragged that he was heir by entail to an estate of 6,000 pounds per annum. Uh, that wasn't true. 
uh, he did come from a wealthy family, but his family was not giving him any money, and his father had disowned him, so Shelley actually had no money at all. Nonetheless, William Godwin thought it would be nice to have a wealthy fan, so he invited Shelley to dinner at the house frequently, hoping that Shelley would spend some of that money on Godwin. Now, it turns out Shelley didn't bring a lot of money, but he did bring himself, and he saw Mary there. And so, uh, Percy, Bysshe, Shelley, and Mary uh, got into a relationship, right? And here's a scene from a Canadian movie called Mary Shelley. Believe it or not, there actually is a Canadian movie called Mary Shelley that predates the one starring Elle Fanning. I might have been one of three people in Canada who saw it. <laughs> so, <laughs> at least I got a DVD from the producer. But anyway, here's a scene from it. By the way, that, that, that blonde actress, I forget her name, but she later played a vampire in Being Human. But anyway, uh, they had a relationship and uh, they would meet and go on dates at the grave of Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin. Right. And so Mary and Percy were very much in love and they wanted to get married, but there was just one problem. And the problem was Harriet. See, Percy Shelley was already married <laughs> to uh, Harriet Westbrook, daughter of a coffee shop merchant. And they already had one daughter, Ian, and they had one son in a way, uh, Charles. Now, Percy left Harriet while Harriet was pregnant uh, so that she, he could chase after Mary, right? This did not make Harriet happy, right? So, what to do? What to do? What does a young couple in love do when one of them is already married? Well, they eloped to France, Germany, and Switzerland on June 14, 1814. But they also took Mary's uh, stepsister, Claire Claremont, with them. Now, you'll see this going on throughout their lives. They always bring Claire Claremont with them. I suspect they had a menage a trois, or that uh, Percy also had something going on with Claire Claremont, which was later proven to be true at, in, in, in uh, Switzerland. Uh, so they ran off to France, Germany, Switzerland, but returned penniless six weeks later. Well, uh, then Mary and Percy had their first child, Mary Jane, yet another person with name Mary Jane. And uh, Mary Jane was born two months premature and unfortunately died in 1815. Now, after this death, of course, the death of any child would traumatize a mother. And Mary dreamed that she had rubbed the baby in front of a fire and the baby came back to life. And you'll see this throughout Mary's life. She had dreams about bringing the dead back to life, right? And what is Frankenstein about? It's about creating a living being out of the parts of dead bodies. Now, after the child died, Percy began to grow closer to Claire, all right? And this did not make Mary happy, all right? And then, but Percy had two more children between 1814 and 16. Harriet gave birth to the son, Charles, even though Percy wasn't there. And then in 1816, uh, Mary gave birth to another child, William. Now, this put Percy in a very difficult position. He now had two families to support and no, no income. So what did he do? Well, he ran away to Switzerland. <laughs> okay. So he, Mary, uh, Percy, Mary, and Claire Claremont ran away to Switzerland to get away from creditors and Harriet. And they went to Switzerland to meet Percy's friend, Lord Byron, right? George Gordon Byron, the sixth Baron Byron, England's most famous romantic poet, uh, best-selling author, and also an infamous celebrity. He had also become the so-called boyfriend of Claire Claremont because Claire had written a fan letter to Lord Byron and in the fan letter had encouraged her, him to come meet her, promising all sorts of physical delights if they were to meet, and he went. Right? And they had a relationship, although this was not the only relationship with a woman that Byron would have at that simultaneously. Right? Now, Byron was notorious in England at the time. If I were to compare him to a celebrity of today, I would say that he was the 19th century's Michael Jackson. Uh, like Michael Jackson, he was very well known by the public. And remember, this is the 19th century before movies and TV are recorded music, so, you know, the people 
read poems and books and stories for their entertainment. And in such an environment, Byron was a superstar and a best-selling author. Uh, but like Michael Jackson, there was a series of sex scandals associated with Lord Byron. Uh, there was, it was reputed that there was no woman he wouldn't sleep with. Uh, it was rumored that he was having an incestuous relationship with his half-sister. Uh, there was a string of illegitimate children, all claiming to have been sired by Lord Byron, and, 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 and a long string of women all claimed to have been dumped by Lord Byron. Right? Uh, so this made him a notorious celebrity. Now, in Switzerland, Lord Byron was living with a friend of his, Dr. John William Polidori. Now, he was a medical doctor who wanted to be a famous writer, but didn't really write a lot. Right? He liked socializing with writers and got to Lord Byron's circle. Uh, but he was also a very possessive person. He was jealous of anyone who received Byron's attention. And he wanted Byron to give all his attention to him. Right? So, and Lord Byron and John Polidori had rented a house by the shore of Lake Geneva. This house was called, and still is called, Villa Diodati. So there, Percy, Mary, Claire Claremont, baby, and baby William uh, joined Byron and Dr. Polidori at this house, and they would spend the summer of 1816 there. Now, usually the shores of Lake Geneva are a great place for vacation, but 1816 wasn't a good year to go there. And actually, it wasn't a good year anywhere in the world. That's because 1816 was the year without a summer. Uh, in April of the previous year, uh, Mount Tambora, a volcano on Sumbawa Island, Indonesia, had erupted. And it was the largest volcanic eruption in recorded history. Some scientists say it was the largest volcanic eruption in 10,000 years. Right? And it spewed 175 cubic kilometers of volcanic ash high enough that it got into the stratosphere. The ash went all over the world. It blocked out the sun. Um, temperatures dropped all over the world. And there were crop failures and famines on every continent. Uh, now, what does this mean for our vacationers by the shore of Lake Geneva? Well, it meant that it rained through much of the summer. Right? So they spent a lot of the summer indoors because of the rain. Now, this is a scene from Bride of Frankenstein, uh, the 1935 movie, and it shows Byron and, and Mary and Percy you know, try, waiting for the rain to end in, at Villa Diodati. But the rain kept on coming. So he now, while they were at Villa Diodati, Byron, as per his standard operating practice, got bored with Claire because right? he would love women and then dump them. And then Claire transferred affection to Percy Shelley again, right? which again did not amuse Mary. Also, Byron and Polidori had developed a love-hate relationship. Although they were, they were friends, they would often get in arguments and fights with each other. One of them got so violent that Polidori hit Byron's leg with a boat oar. And there was a lot of competition going on between the men at Villa Diodati. Uh, Polidori and Shelley and Byron would go on sailboat races on Lake Geneva when the weather was suitable. And after one race, the Polidori was so upset that Shelley had beaten him that he challenged Shelley to a duel. And then Byron offered to take Shelley's place in duel because Byron said he wanted to shoot Polidori. <laughs> now, if you watch Bride of Frankenstein's first scene, you'll get the impression that that summer at Villa Diodati was a very genteel affair with people in fancy clothes discussing literature and horror stories while one of their friends plays a harpsichord in the background. Right? Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Basically, what these five adults did was they cheated on each other, slept with each, each other's partners, got in arguments, fought, threatened violence against each other, and when, they, and, you know, when they weren't sleeping with each other's partners, the exception was Dr. John Polidori, because no one wanted to have sex with him, right? <laughs> and this was all going on while baby William was upstairs with a nanny, right? So it was hardly the peaceful, genteel, cultured summer that Bride of Frankenstein shows it to be. But they didn't spend all their time fighting or, or hitting each other or, or quarreling or, or, or cheating on each other's partners. Uh, 
They were literati, so they spent a lot of time talking about philosophy and literature. Well, two of them did. Uh, Byron and Shelley competed to be alpha dog in the pack because they were the two most famous writers. And they would have long evenings where they talked about literature and philosophy and science and art. Right? Now, the other three, Mary, Claire Claremont, and Dr. Polidori, their role was to listen silently and agree with the other two. Right? Now, occasionally, one of them would voice an opinion of his or her own, in which case, Byron and Shelley would either dismiss the opinion, ignore it, or congratulate them for agreeing with smarter people. Right? In fact, Mary had this to say about the summer at Villa Diodati. Many and long were the conversations between Lord Byron and Shelley, to which I was a devout but nearly silent listener. Okay. Now, they had a book at the villa. It was called Phantasmagoriana, Tales of the Dead. And it's an anthology of German horror stories translated to French and English. And like a lot of writers at the time, uh, they liked horror stories and ghost stories because this was a time of Gothic fiction. So Byron proposed a ghost story contest that would each write a ghost story. And at the same time, Mary had a dream. Right? Yeah, I know this is a classic movie, right? It's young Frankenstein. Uh, Mary dreamed that there was a man who was creating a body of the parts of dead bodies, and he was bringing life to that body. So she began writing a story based on that dream, the story that would eventually become Frankenstein. And Byron started writing a vampire story, and Percy Shelley wrote a fragment of a ghost story, an eight-line poem, Claire Claremont wrote nothing. <laughs> and John Paul Dory wrote nothing yet, but he would. On September 1816, uh, Percy Shelley, Mary, Claire, ba and baby William, they returned to, to England, right, to Bath. And Mary continued writing Frankenstein. Now, Frankenstein, the story, incorporates a lot of her feelings on death and life. Uh, obviously, the story is influenced by the death of her mother after childbirth. It's also influenced by her dreams of reviving her dead daughter, Mary Jane. And because a lot of people in Mary's life had died as innocents, like they didn't deserve to die, they had done nothing wrong, um, innocent people die in the Frankenstein novel. Um, there's William, a boy who's killed by the monster. And then there's Justine, who people blame for the death of William, and they hang her instead of the monster. Right? So a lot of Mary's personal life and history is in, or has inf influenced, Frankenstein. Then in fall 1816, death struck the women associated with Mary and Percy. On October 9, 1816, Fanny Inlay committed suicide by poison. Uh, no one knows why she committed suicide. And then on December 1816, Harriet Shelley drowned herself in the Serpentine, that river that runs through Hyde Park. Uh, this was not altogether bad news for Percy Shelley because he got married to Mary 20 days later. Right? So now Mary Godwin assumed the Mary name of Mary Shelley, the name by which she is most famous. Now in the summer of 1817, Mary finished writing Frankenstein, and in January 1818, it was published. Now when the novel was published, it was published anonymously. There was no author byline. And many people suspected that Percy Shelley had actually written it. But Percy denied that he had written it, and later revealed that it was his wife, Mary had written it. Well, this created a sensation. First, the book was already a bestseller uh, with the anonymous byline. People just loved buying it and reading it. And the fact that a young woman had written it made it even more famous because back then, young women authors were very rare, right? And a best-selling one, best-selling young woman author, even much more rare. This made Mary a, a celebrity overnight. 
But Frankenstein wasn't the only literary legacy of the summer at Villa Diodati. In April 1st, 1819, Dr. Polidori published a short story called The Vampire. And in The Vampire, uh, there's, a, there's a vampire called Lord Ruthven. Now, vampires had already existed in legend and myth for centuries, and they existed in fiction for centuries as well. But uh, up until then, vampires were usually ugly, smelly monsters without much personality that sucked your blood and then killed you, right? They, they, they weren't any, they were, you know, I guess today that, that role has been assumed by zombie movies, right? But uh, back then, vampires were really grotesque monsters. But Lord Ruth then, in Dr. Polidori's The Vampire, was a different type of vampire. He was a handsome nobleman who seduced and destroyed women. Now, a lot of people thought, aha, uh -huh, this is a metaphor for Lord Byron. And it, it probably was. But uh, think of it. This image of the vampire as being a handsome nobleman who seduces women, what does that remind you of? Well, it reminds you of this character, Dracula. And Dr. Polidori had created the archetype of vampires that we see in vampire fiction to this day. Uh, Bram Stoker wrote Dracula, and so a lot of people credit Bram Stoker for, created, for creating the archetype of the aristocratic, seductive, handsome vampire, but he had actually taken that archetype from Dr. Polidori. Now, when the vampire was published, the uh, magazine editor who published it erroneously put the byline by Lord Byron on it. So people thought Byron had published it, but Byron said, no, no, that, that's an error. I did not write this story, right? And then later, uh, people discovered that it was Dr. John Polidori who wrote it. So to this day, uh, now Polidori gets the credit he deserves for writing The Vampire. And here's the irony of Villa Diodati. Uh, the two less talented writers at Villa Diodati made the most lasting and well-known contributions to English literature. Uh, remember that Mary and Dr. Polidori, they weren't supposed to talk about literature or philosophy at Villa Diodati. Their job was to listen to Byron and Shelley and just agree with them, right? But everyone has heard of Frankenstein. Even if you haven't heard, read the novel, you've probably seen at least one movie or TV version or read the comic book or eaten a breakfast cereal named after it, right? And even if you've never read The Vampire by John Polidori or haven't read Bram Stoker's Dracula, you know what that character is. You've seen the archetype of the aristocratic, handsome vampire. You've probably seen a movie with such a character in it. So everybody has seen Frankenstein or the vampire in one way or another. Uh, contrast that to how many people have really read or remember a story by Percy Bysshe Shelley, right? Or Lord Byron, right? Uh, I, I, I doubt many people here can actually remember uh, any th a poem by Lord Byron, right? People know the name though, but Let's face it, uh, Mary Shelley and John Polidori made the most lasting contributions to literature and her culture. Now, there seems to have been a curse on Villa Diodati. Uh, between 1819 and 1824, death struck all the males who were at Villa Diodati in the summer of 1816. Uh, the first to die was young William. Uh, he, at only age three and a half years, he died of malaria in 1819. And then Dr. Polidori, Polidori did not have a great, great life either. Uh, he finally departed from Byron in September 16, 1816, and went to Milan where he was expelled for quarreling with a guard. Then he went to Pisa and became private physician to three English expatriates, all of whom died quickly one after the other. Right? Uh, then he went to Norwich to practice medicine. And then he gave up medicine and went to London to write The Vampire. But that didn't make him happy either. And on August 24th, 1821, he committed suicide in London. Uh, Shelley met a tragic end too. In the 1820s, uh, Percy Shelley and Mary Shelley moved to Italy. 
and like a lot of upper class wealthy um, English expatriates, they moved around from city to city. And Shelley always liked boating. He had raced sailboats with Lord Byron and Dr. Polidori at Lake Geneva. And in near Tuscany, he had bought a new boat and he caught Don Juan. And he and two friends set out sailing one day. But they ran to bad weather and the boat capsized. Uh, their bodies washed up to the shore 10 days later. And some local Italian uh, residents found the bodies and buried them in the sand at the beach. Then later, Mary and her friends went out and exhumed the bodies. Italian law at that time did not permit bodies who had washed up in shore and then buried to be removed from the beach uh, for, for sanitary reasons, right? They were afraid that the bodies could be carrying disease. So Mary cremated Percy at the beach, and here's the painting, The Death of Shelley. And uh, when she, the fire was finished, the only things that remained of Shelley were his bones and his heart. He, was literally, he literally had a hard heart. Um, people suspected it calcified because of an earlier disease he had, uh, possibly um, <clears throat> malaria. Right? So she, Mary kept that heart with her for the rest of her life. Now, Lord Byron came to a, an interesting end, too. In 1821, the Greeks rose in rebellion against Ottoman Turkish rule. Right? And this uprising, you know, people all over Europe watched what was going on. And Lord Byron announced that he was going to go to Greece and fight for Greek independence. Well, this surprised a lot of people. He'd spent basically his whole adult life writing poetry and um, sleeping with women and dumping them. <coughs> Why would he suddenly want to run off and fight for the independence of another people? Uh, some people suspect that he was always interested in the Balkans anyway. Uh, occasionally he'd, uh, he'd appear in London wearing Balkan costumes, like Albanian costumes. Uh, some people think that Perhaps as he got older, he suddenly realized he had to do something good in his life, right? So he ran away to Greece to uh, fight in the Greek War of Independence, despite his complete lack of military experience. However, the Greek, he had something the Greeks wanted, money. Remember, he was a, a millionaire, right? Very wealthy celebrity. So the Greeks took his money to help fund the war. Also, being a celebrity, he was a good spokesperson for the Greek cause back in Western Europe. Alas, things did not go well for Lord Byron in Greece. He developed a fever and got ill. Uh, no one knows what caused the fever. It could have been a recurrence of a malaria he had previously. Uh, and what his physicians in Greece did, they used a very old method of, of healing, which doesn't work. They cut him and bled him, right? Because remember, back then, bleeding was one way physicians tried to cure their patients. However, this was the 1820s. Um, Louis Pasteur and, and Lister were still 40 years away from promoting the sterilization of medical instruments. And his physicians used unclean and sterilized instruments on Byron. So he got infected and died of sepsis, right? And that was how Lord Byron died in Greece. The two survivors of Villa Diodati were Mary Shelley, who lived to 1851, and Claire Claremont, who actually made it into the late Victorian era, all the way to 1879. And indeed, as in her last years, she still said that Shelley was the love of her life. So there probably was a menage a trois going on between Percy, Mary, and Claire. Now let's look at the Frankenstein name. There actually is a burg or castle, Frankenstein, near Darmstadt, Germany. There it is. And there is a line of Barons Frankenstein in Germany. Uh, the most notable one is George von Frankenstein, who lived in the 16th century. There's a legend that he killed a dragon. And the Frankenstein family is quite illustrious. It has had soldiers, diplomats, politicians, judges, artists, 
but no alchemists or mad scientists. So where did the name come from? Well, some people think it might have come from a fellow named Johann Conrad Dippo, who was born in 1673 at Castle Frankenstein. Now, he was not a member of the Frankenstein family. Rather, during one of the wars going on there, refugees took refuge in Castle Frankenstein, and Dippo's parents were two of the refugees who had found refuge there. Right? But uh, when he went to university, he added the name Frankensteinesis to his name to show that he came from Frankenstein. Uh, Dippo was a notable alchemist and anatomist of his time, and he's most famous for inventing the Prussian blue pigment. Right? So you ever seen the color Prussian blue? Thank Johann Conrad Dippo. Right? But as an alchemist and an anatomist, of course, people spread rumors about him. Right? Being an alchemist, you know, his goal was to change elements from one to the other. Right? And people often associate alchemy as being something related to witchcraft. Right? And being an anatomist, that meant he spent a lot of time with dead bodies. So, of course, there were rumors about what he was doing with the dead bodies. Right? So, some of these rumors may have reached Mary when she was in the continent, and she may have used the name Frankenstein as the name of the character in her novel. And by the way, here's a scene from The Curse of Frankenstein, starring Peter Cushing as the doctor. Well, as I mentioned, the novel Frankenstein was immediately popular and became a bestseller, and spin-offs started as early as 1823 with a play based on the novel at the Lyceum Theatre in London. And you still see these spin-offs today. I've lost track of how many Frankenstein movies and TV shows and comic books there are. Uh, now, the plays are amusing because here are two advertising posters from Broadway plays in New York based on Frankenstein. In 2007, uh, Mark Barron put on an off-Broadway musical called Frankenstein, a new musical. And earlier this year, Eric B. Soda put on an off-Broadway musical, also called Frankenstein, a new musical. Right? Uh, and that sometimes there could be two Frankenstein musicals or plays playing in New York at the same time, and sometimes they even have the same title. Right? It makes ticket buying very confusing. Even more interesting, uh, the Mark Barron musical, uh, Frankenstein, a new musical, uh, opened at the same time a musical based on Mel Brooks' Young Frankenstein opened on Broadway. Right? I'm pretty sure a lot of people bought the wrong tickets. Right? Right? Oh, and you see spin-offs everywhere. There's a comic book version from Classics Illustrated, not the only comic book version. And there's also that breakfast cereal, Frank and Barry. And there are countless movies based on Frankenstein. Here, Ed, Thomas Edison made the first Frankenstein movie in 1910. It was thought lost, but a century later, someone discovered it in his film collection. And it was restored in 2016 by the Film Society of the University of Geneva, and then restored again in 2018 uh, by Americans. And the Library of Congress has uploaded its restoration to YouTube, so you can watch it there. And in 1931, Universal Studios released what has to be the most famous version of Frankenstein, the one starring Boris Karloff as the monster. Uh, though not all Frankenstein movies are as classic or as reputable as the one made starring Boris Karloff, uh, here are two of the lesser ones. On the left, you have Jesse Jays meets Frankenstein's daughter. Yes, a combination of horror and Western. And on the right, uh, you see Hammer Films' Frankenstein Created Woman, where it turns out that Dr. Frankenstein also specializes in plastic surgery and breast implants. Right? These are not exactly the classics. And if you think these are bizarre ideas, what about Frankenstein's monster as a detective? Yes, it's been done once already. In 2004, in a TV movie called Frankenstein, just Frankenstein, and oddly enough, this is based on a series of novels by Dean R. Kuntz, the horror writer, where Frankenstein's monster takes on a new career as a police detective. Now, strangely enough, this idea is actually coming back from the dead. 
there's actually an order out right now for a TV pilot for Frankenstein's monster as a detective. <laughs> and I think that's coming from uh, the guys who make that Sherlock Holmes based show, Elementary, right? So why was Frankenstein so immediately popular when it was published back in 1818? Well, it tapped into tr a trend of its time, gothic fiction. The people of the Regency period just loved gothic fiction. They liked ghost stories, they liked vampire stories, they liked stories of things that go bump in the night in the dark castle. And Frankenstein definitely fed into that trend. And it was also very topical at the time. Uh, it dealt with issues of the new science. Here is Luigi Galvini. And Galvini, you may have heard the term in galvanism, right? He had experimented by running electrical currents through the legs of dead frogs and discovered that he could make the frog's legs jump and move. So people were wondering whether electricity could be used to bring the dead back to life, right? And of course, this was a very topical subject of discussion in science in the newspapers back then, and Mary Shelley exploited it for her novel. But Frankenstein has a lasting appeal. Uh, it wasn't the only Gothic novel published at the time, and it wasn't the only one that became best, a bestseller. Here are two of the other popular novels at the time, The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole, and uh, Vathek by William Beckford, but I bet you very few of you have actually read it, read either of these books. Uh, in fact, the only people I know who actually either read or heard of these books tend to be people going for advanced degrees in English literature of the early 19th century. <laughs> right? So why is Frankenstein still remembered while these other books of the time are forgotten? Well, that's because, oops, uh, a lot of Frankenstein's themes are still on our minds. Uh, we still debate issues of the ethics of scientific research, which is interesting because all of the movies and comic books and comic strips have made Frankenstein out to be a story about, you know, unethical scientific research. The novel actually isn't about that. The novel is really about a child being abandoned by his father. Right? Because that's what drives the creature to do his evil deeds, is that after Frankenstein creates them, he rushes out of the room in horror and leaves the monster without a father figure. Right? And, the father, and the creature feels abandoned and lonely and wanders the countryside looking for people who would accept him. Right? And another reason why the Frankenstein story is still in our minds is because we're still worried about the creation that kills its creator, right? Uh, this is fail-safe. Some of you would have seen this movie. It's about a U.S. computer system that accidentally triggers a nuclear war, right? And we're always cognizant about how our computer systems and our technology might backfire on us. In fact, I think we should include Facebook and social media on this sometimes, right? And there are certain themes in Frankenstein that have existed throughout the whole history of human society that always recur in our myths and legends and stories. There's the artificial being. Here's a very old story about the artificial being, the Gollum, the Jewish legend from the uh, Middle Ages. Right? An artificial being created out of mud to protect a, uh, a Jewish neighborhood in, in Poland, I believe. Right? And this story of the artificial being recurs throughout human history. And since there have been humans, humans have always wondered if they could conquer death. This goes at least back to the Epic of Gilgamesh, where Gilgamesh sets off on a journey to find a way to uh, bring his dead friend back to life. And here's another pair of eternal themes from our from literature, the abandoned child, and conflict between parent and child. Uh, some of you would have read uh, Oedipus the King, you know, when, when you were in school. And it's, it's a very old story about conflict between parent and child, and an abandoned child, because Oedipus was originally abandoned as well. And you can see that Mary's 
history influenced the development of this theme in Frankenstein. Uh, she seems to have been surrounded by people who abandoned their children. Uh, she herself grew up without a mother. She didn't abandon, like, her mother didn't abandon her, but died uh, and never got to raise her. All right. And uh, it also, Mary, unfortunately, would never raised her first child because the first child died young. So if you look at the way Frankenstein is studied today, you know, at, at any university or English lit course, some people approach it as gothic literature, some people approach it as romantic literature, some people approach it as science fiction, uh, some people, especially the film historians, approach it as potboiler thriller. Uh, it's even managed to get into gender studies now. People analyze it for, uh, for how it portrays the roles of men and women in the story, right? Because traditionally in, in, in literature, if a male was going after scientific research, it would always end well, but not in the story. Right? And people also have looked for it for its Freudian ideas. And, and you know, there are a lot of Freudian ideas in, in, in Frankenstein. So perhaps that's why Frankenstein remains so popular 201 years after it's written, because it's like a raw chart of our society. People see in it what they want to see in it. People see in it things that, ref that they can relate to. So it could be a horror story. It could be uh, a, a horror movie. It could be gothic fiction. Or it could be a breakfast cereal. Right? And that is why Frankenstein endures with us today. So if you see someone dressed up as Frankenstein's monster tomorrow, uh, just realize that that person is part of a long literary legacy. Thank you. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.